Well, all right, welcome again to Discovery Church. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today, you guys. Come on. Everyone watching us online or wherever you're joining us, so glad you're here for the beginning, part one of a new series that we're calling Anxious for Nothing. And today's message is titled Redefining Anxiety. And what I want to do today is to help you build a foundation for this kind of life that is truly an anxious for nothing kind of life. Because the biggest battles that you and I or anyone actually ever will face are the battles nobody else sees. It's the battles going on in our mind. It's the battle going on inside of our emotions, how we deal with how we feel. And this message series is for those that today maybe you're a little heavy in spirit. You're weighed down. You're worried. You're stressed. It could be for a variety of reasons. It could be your finances that have you concerned today. It could be your relationship, your marriage. It could be your aging parents or your own health. Sending kids off to school or just the crazy world that we're living in, you could be experiencing stress or anxiety for a number of different reasons. And because I know this can be a hard message and series for those of you that have struggled with anxiety, because you've studied this. If you struggle with anxiety today or any of these symptoms I'm talking about today, you've studied this. You've tried so many things to fix this. But can I ask you to just give me maybe the next 40 minutes of this message before you put up walls and start to compare and conflict what I'm saying with the blog you read or the article you read or the specialist, what they told you, because I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you today. And so if you can just give me the next 40 minutes without, without kind of putting up a wall, let's go on a journey together through God's word. I want to lay the foundation today. And quite honestly, I can't even do this subject justice with just one message. I'm going to be studying this with you for the next four weeks. So I would even say, maybe give me not just 40 minutes, but give me four weeks to tackle this subject from the various nuances and directions through God's word to help bring revelation and light into our soul. In fact, can we just do something to start off this message? Can we just take a deep breath together? God is here. He's here. One more time. Take a deep breath with me. He's here, and he wants to speak to you today. The main text of our, our series today is going to come from Philippians, but let me give you a little background about this, and I'll give a lot of supporting scriptures as well uh, with this main scripture, uh, but to give me a, a little background, because it's not just this one text in Philippians that I want to study. I actually want to study this person who wrote it, the Apostle Paul, because I think we can learn a lot from the person who's penning these letters on how to live like this anxious for nothing kind of life. Because here is Paul. Paul's writing this letter to the church in Philippi. We call it the letters Philippians. But he's writing from prison. And he wanted to. And he had his desire in his heart to go to Rome and preach the gospel in Rome. And he finds himself in Rome. But he's in prison in Rome. So the circumstances are not what he thought it was. And he's under a great amount of pressure and something he never thought he actually would be subject to. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to start at verse 4 today, and he says this, the apostle Paul says from prison, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And he's not saying that like a phony. I believe he's got some joy inside of him that no matter what's happening outside of him, he can give a declaration of rejoice, I say, in the Lord. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Take that deep breath. The Lord is near. I know it may not look like it in the dungeon or the prison or your pain. I understand that, but the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. And that's where we get the title of this series. The Apostle Paul says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving... Let your requests be made known to God. And if you do that, he says, the peace of God, which surpasses all of your understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So today I, wanna, I want us to redefine anxiety and how we can build a life and a mindset like Paul that isn't crushed by our circumstances. And, and, and it's important for us to know that anxiety isn't a sin, you guys. 
It's not. Anxiety in itself, it's not as in. Anxiety is a signal. Your emotions are like traffic signals. That's what they are. Traffic light signals. You listen to them to stop and go, but they don't tell you where to go. For most people, anxiety isn't the problem. It's a signal that there is a problem. It's a signal that you need to quit running. Stop fighting. Stop hiding and deal with the issue. We have to learn how to turn and stare down anxious threats with the assurance that I am fully capable of responding in a way that will deliver a new life for me and a new life for my family and a new legacy. That doesn't have to deal with this. But if we don't know what anxiety is or how to respond to anxiety, I think for a lot of people, anxiety becomes this default setting in our life it's just this default we're just default to anxiety and it happens very easily it happens through something called the habit loop and i've studied this with you guys before but let me show you the habit loop take some notes with me today the habit loop starts with this it starts with a trigger something triggers right something happens in our internal our external environment that triggers anxiety in you and then you you have this response a behavioral response to the trigger, we execute some, some sort of behavior. Then, based on that behavior, we get a reward based upon what behavior we, we responded to the trigger. So let me give you an example. Like, like, for instance, your body could be triggered by finances. Maybe it's when you're looking at your financial budget. Maybe it's when you get a new bill in the mail and you open it and you get like, oh my gosh, where did this come from? Or, or you get an email from a creditor or something and you've been trying to ignore it, but hear it again. It, it just sends off some anxiety alarms to fight, flight, or freeze. And in response to that alarm, you might shut off the media giving you the report. Or maybe you're filled with anger and you take it out on the Postmates delivery guy to your door. Or maybe you grab a drink and another drink. Or maybe you grab a bag of candy or some ice cream. Or you buy something and another thing. Or maybe you just scroll yourself to death, numbing it down on social media. And for a moment, your body feels good. You've quieted the alarms and you get this feeling for a moment. You get a feeling of superiority. You get that sugar rush. You get that shopper's high and your brain craves the numbness that you gave it. You gave it this numb or powerful or satisfied feeling and the feedback loop is created. However you responded. So when you ran to the fridge, you're gonna go into the fridge again when the anxiety comes or when you run to pornography in your anxiety when it comes up again your brain's going to want that pornography or when you run to whatever you are feeding the trigger with rewarding your your trigger with it's going to crave that and we will do anything as humans to stop to like avoid it avoid to avoid the real problem i mean we'll do food drugs alcohol work we'll google what happened to the cast of the office with a work deadline looming Rage, anger, imaginary conversations in our head or obsessive thinking. We'll, we'll, we'll use sex or exercise or trying to be perfect, being right and power plays, starting fights, buying and buying and buying and collecting and organizing and hoarding stuff and cleaning your house and mercilessly talking down to ourselves, doom scrolling on social media, staying up to the minute on current news and crisis and global tragedy and more data, more data, more data. And all these things, they're not necessarily bad in and of themselves. They can actually be good in the right context. But when they're used to deflect, to avoid, to cover up your anxiety, they become a destructive and toxic habit loop. Now, the reality is, you don't need me telling you this, but life is hard. Life is is really hard and it'll keep throwing punches and elbows and kicks and you're gonna get fired and you're gonna lose loved ones and you're gonna hurt those that care about you the most but we can no longer try to avoid those bad things happening to us you are gonna get hit in life you're gonna get hit a lot and we gotta build we have to figure out how to build the kind of anxious for nothing life that can actually take the blows and not get crushed by it, to take the hits and absorb it, 
This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. I believe what it, how he lived his life, not just in Philippians, but look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, what he tells the Corinthian church. He says, we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Like, like I can be experiencing these things, but I built a life internally and around me that can actually absorb the blows from this life. Whatever's being thrown at me, I can absorb the blows. Here's what he says. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. Here's what he's saying. That the world is going to see how you respond in your body to the stressors around you. And because you don't respond like the world responds, they're going to say, I see Jesus in that person. Something's different about them. The way that they're responding. Look what he says. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies everybody else is responding one way but the life of jesus is respond is 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 inside of you something else is coming out of you how do we how do we learn to live this kind of life how do we how do we create the life inside of us and around us that is anxious for nothing that can still go through that can still be hard pressed perplexed persecuted struck down but i'm not destroyed by it i'm not crushed by it i'm not abandoned by it i'm not in despair by it something else is coming out of me in it how do, is that is that even possible to live this kind of life i believe it is and i believe if we take a look at god's word and maybe take a look at what he's been trying to tell us we can learn how to live this kind of life let me give you a few things though what anxiety is not anxiety is not your identity it's not who you are. Stop wearing this, this as an identity badge, your anxiety as an identity badge. As you walk around the world, like, this is just the way I do it. This is just who I am. I understand that putting a label on your specific issue, it might help name the dragon because then you can slay the dragon. It identifies it for you. Like, I understand that's an important step, but just because they've diagnosed you with an anxiety disorder, a bipolar disorder, or the hundred variations of diagnosis so they can medicate your feelings away and get rich off you, it's not who you are. It's not your identity. Your identity is in Christ. And God may be trying to do something in you, and you keep pulling yourself back to, oh, yeah, but I'm, bi I'm bipolar. No, 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 you are not. You're not even who you were last year. Come on, that's not who you are. It's not your identity. Here's another thing it's not. It's not your problem. Uh, I hope to redefine anxiety for us today. It's not your problem. The, here, the problem is, listen to me, the problem is we're unsafe, disconnected, and unhealthy, and we're living like we have no say in what happens next in our life. Let me say that again. Here's the problem. We are unsafe, disconnected, and unhealthy, and we're living our life like we have no say in what in the heck is happening. You, we got frantic, chaotic, roller coaster lives. And you know that there's more to life, but we don't know where to turn. We're anxious going to work. You're anxious coming home from work. We're glued to our phones for the latest news and rumors. And we've outsourced romance to The Bachelor. We've outsourced our homes to Chip and Joanna. You've outsourced your spiritual lives to Instagram. And you've outsourced parenting to digital devices. We snap at our children. We try to remove the stress by adding more things. Maybe another planner will do it. Maybe the next yoga class or cycling class or, or, or maybe it's, it's, it's a new diet I need. We use chemicals to wake us up in the morning and then we rely on pills or drinks to drift us into the dark sleep at night. All the while, we're living in an environment we were never made for. Let me say that again another way. We've created a world our bodies cannot exist in. The world, the ecosystem that you have created, your body is telling you something is wrong every day in a thousand ways. God is trying to get our attention through our bodies, screaming at us, sounding the alarms that we're disconnected and lonely and we're unsafe and we're unhealthy. And we've gotten, given away all of our autonomy and now our bosses and our mortgage companies and our in-laws and academic advisors, they're controlling our lives. And then it happens. You're, taking someone on, you're talking to someone online that's not your wife. You're sneaking a drink at work or at home. 
you drift into isolation, you stop going to church as much, and you and your spouse stop having sex. You and your, your spouse, you have no common purpose. You, you're just glorified roommates. You just live in parallel lives. We don't know how we got here, but we don't know what to do next. We don't know, we don't know what the real problem is. The anxiety is not your problem. Write this down. Anxiety is the alarm system. That's what it is. It's actually God's alarm system. God designed that within you. An alarm is not to, it's, it's to notify you. It's to alert you, right? Alarms are to be notified, not to be terrified. Imagine a scene with me. That you're in your house and you're trying to relax after a hard week, hard day, whatever it is. And you put on your favorite Netflix, Hulu, something. You put on your show, okay? And you're trying to relax, but the fire alarm's going off because this is what you see in your living room. There's a fire in your living room. And, and, and as there's a fire going, you, and the alarm, it, bah, 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 you're like, this stupid alarm, you're trying to just ignore it. How do I drown? And then you, you say, I, I got an idea. Here's what I'll do. You get some pillows and duct tape, and you get up there, and you duct tape the alarm. And, oh, I wish this alarm would just shut up, man. I'm trying to. And you sit back down, and you're waving through the smoke, and you're just trying to focus on your show, drown out the noise. And for a while, it works. You're like, okay, this is dull. I can hear, the, I can hear better now. Until the smoke and fire fills the room around you, and all the other alarms are going off, and you have this bright idea. I'll just take out the, the batteries. That's what I'll do. You just go around and take out all the batteries and plop back down all the while your house is on fire. Look, your body and mind would be failing you if you could actually watch TV comfortably when your fire alarms were going off and you were in a fire. Your body would be failing you if, if, if fight Flight or freeze didn't, didn't rise up within you. If you could actually sit through that alarm system blaring and that fire and smoke billowing and your body and mind would be failing you if you could comfortably sleep at night while you haven't talked to your kids in days. You keep getting further in debt. You, you feel like you're sleeping next to a stranger because you don't invest into your marriage as much as you try to ignore those realities. Your spirit knows Something's on fire. And the alarm is blaring. You don't want to face the real issue. You just want to put duct tape and pillows on the alarm. And your house is on fire. How do we redefine and change how we respond to what God is trying to tell us through the signals he's given us? How do we become Anxious for nothing. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Another way to say it is how do we become anti-fragile? Now, don't, don't get all walled up on me. Who are you calling fragile? You know what I mean? Calm down. Let me, just, let me just, I told you don't put the wall up on me, okay? I'm not saying, I'm not saying you're fragile. I'm just saying that maybe we need the, the anti-version of, of what, fra- this is actually a book that was written by um, Nassim Nicholas Tlaib. It's a great read if you guys want to read it. Anti-fragile means this, building a life that grows and thrives during times of great distress and upheaval. That, that maybe there's a way that we could live, build the kind of life inside of us and around us that, that not only is anxious for nothing, but actually thrives and gets better through the trials and, and challenges in our life. Maybe we can learn how to live anti-fragile, anxious for nothing. Here's how, again, the Apostle Paul, look what he says in Romans chapter 8. He says, no, look, despite all these pressures happening to us, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen right there? Do you realize this? Oh, despite all the stuff going on in the world, going on at home, going on in your job, going on in news, overwhelming victory is ours in Christ who loved us. And then he says, and I'm convinced, and I hope that you can be convinced of some new things today, that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. How do we live this kind of life? This kind of life that can absorb the hits of this crazy world, to not 
try to numb it or silence it or run from it, but turn and face it down. And not only, like, and get better and grow from it. Okay, let me, let me give it to you. A, few, a few things that we need to build this anxious for nothing life. Number one, we have to embrace uncertainty. Embrace uncertainty uncertainty. So in order to do this, you and I, we got to recognize, you guys, the fragility of control. Our need to control the outcomes, to control the people around us, to control the scenarios is the reason why many of us have the anxiety we do. The more you try to control in your life, the more vulnerable you are to anxiety. Control is an illusion. You don't have it. In fact, you don't need certainty. Listen to me. You need to trust God. I don't need certainty. I need to trust God. Will you say that with me? I don't need certainty. I need to trust God. That's how I begin to break the cycle of this bad loop that's inside. I don't need to figure it out. I don't need certainty. I've got to realize, although I don't have the power to control, I do have the power to surrender. I don't have the power to control this. I do have the power to surrender. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. I didn't have enough room to put it in your notes, but I want to read the entire context of what Jesus is saying about worry and anxiety. In Matthew 6, starting at 25, up here, look at it. It says, therefore, Jesus says, I tell you, do not worry about your life. I know there's a lot you don't understand. I know there's a lot of uncertainties. I know you're worried about what you can eat or drink or about your body, what you're going to wear, your health. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can, you, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See the flowers of the field, how they grow. They, they don't labor or spin. He says, yet I tell you not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothed the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Or what's going to happen next? Or how am I going to figure it out? For the pagans run after those things. People who don't know God and don't trust God are stressed about that. People who don't know God or trust God, their bodies respond like that, not yours. Their, their bodies get triggered like that, not yours. Pagans run after those things. Your heavenly father knows you need them, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all that stuff that you can't control anyway, God can. And he will provide for you. So what's your responsibility? I seek him first, his kingdom, his righteousness. And I don't try to control the things that are not in my power to control. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. It's not yours. Listen to me, child of God. Tomorrow is not yours. It doesn't belong to you. It does not belong to you. You cannot control it. And the more you try to control it and the people around you, and the more you try to grab for certainty in this life, the more anxiety you're going to have. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You can't control tomorrow. Uncertainty is built into the human existence. And Jesus says, don't worry about it. Trust God with it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we don't see. Okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna see it all, know it all, be able to figure it out, but that's where I need faith. I don't need certainty. I need to trust God. Paul said, remember in Philippians, and the peace of God that, tra that transcends your understanding will guard your heart and mind. If you want this peace of God, then you're gonna have to surrender your need to control and understand. As long as you need to understand and you need to control, then you are not gonna have the peace of God. So this is the first step in order for us to build this kind of life inside of us, outside of us. You have to be able to expect it, embrace uncertainty. Number two, build resilience. Build resilience. So I got to embrace the variability of life, but I also have to embrace the volatility of life. Because life, again, is hard. It's difficult to be resilient, to be hard-pressed but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, struck down, but not destroyed. It's not merely about enduring through hardships, but thriving because of them. 
Like, I'm going to learn from the failure. I'm going to learn from the pain. I'm going to learn from the setback. We can use those as opportunities for adaptation and improvement. Setbacks and challenges are actually God's opportunity for us to catalyze our growth. It can deepen our faith in God. It can refine our character. This is what it means to build resilience, to, to actually absorb the blows. This is what James is talking about, I think, in James chapter 1, verse 2. He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Talk about redefining anxiety. Maybe you need to, need to look at this thing differently. Maybe you need to consider it differently when you're facing the trials that you're going through because you know that the testing of your faith, look what it's doing, is producing perseverance in you. God is developing inside of you through the testing and the trial and the trigger. And he says, let perseverance finish its work because God wants you mature and complete. He wants you to lack nothing. Okay, like embrace the uncertainty. Allow, allow resilience to build. In order to do that, you got to face it. You don't numb it. You don't quiet it. You don't silence it. You have to embrace it. Consider it pure joy. I'm being developed through this. This is an opportunity for me to adapt, for me to change, for me to figure something new out, for me to pivot, for me to, this is an opportunity for me to become more mature, complete. God's trying to develop something inside of me. Build resilience. Number three, acknowledge the alarm. Acknowledge the alarm. Stop trying, stop ignoring it. Stop silencing it. Stop numbing it. Stop isolating it away, drinking it away, taking pills for it to go away. Whether it's through doom scrolling or, or taking it out on the people closest to you. Anxiety, remember, it's the body's alarm system. God can use it to get our attention. Something's on fire in your life. Maybe instead of fighting it or Taking the thought captive. You know, some of you are like, oh, that anxiety. I'm going to take, take that thought captive. Bring it into the obedience of Christ. Maybe, maybe that anxiety is not the problem. Maybe that anxiety signal was actually God's way to alert you. You do have a problem, though. Maybe some of you are over-spiritualizing so you don't have to face what's really going on in your home. Maybe some of you would really love for the anxiety to go away, but you really don't want to face down your marriage issues. Are y'all with me today? Can I preach like this, you guys? Come on. Maybe instead of fighting it and taking it you, taking the thought captive isn't going to help when the alarm is just trying to notify you. That, that if you keep ignoring your debt and getting further and further into debt and keep spending, you're putting your marriage and your family in danger. You can try to ignore it, but your spirit knows something's on fire. Something's on fire. And you numb it for a while, and then it comes back, and you can't sleep, and it triggers, and it, something's on fire here, and you're not addressing it. Anxiety isn't the problem. The spirit, your spirit knows that your marriage is in trouble, that you only have sex once a month, and they're frustrated, and you're tired, and, and you try to ignore it, but your spirit knows something's on fire. Anxiety isn't a sin. Anxiety doesn't have to be destructive if we build an anxious for nothing life. We have to build this anxious, anxious for nothing life in order to, to take the hits and keep growing. Look what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11. After he's talking about all of his perplexities and challenges and troubles, he goes, and besides those things that are without, there's the daily inescapable pressure of my care and anxiety for all the churches. How many got any daily inescapable pressures? Anyone in here got any daily inescapable pressures? Come on, you got kids in here? Get out of here. You got daily inescapable pressures. Do you have a job? You got some daily inescapable pressures. If you don't raise your hand, then you ain't going to have a job for long, okay? It's a daily inescapable pressure. How are you going to deal with all, all this pressure? All this pressure in your life. You know, maybe, maybe you can just become an Uber driver and manage your own schedule. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. It was over the line. This, he says, he's, I, I got daily pressure. I got anxiety for all the churches. And it's, anxiety is not the problem. It's just, it's alerting me that there is a problem. There's some problems in the churches that I planted. Paul was a missionary. He planted a lot of churches and there were some problems and he had the daily pressure. He didn't numb it and run away from it. He addressed them head on. Here's the problems. Here's what we need. We need to face it. We need to acknowledge the alarm. Stop silencing it. Stop numbing it. Stop over-spiritualizing it. Acknowledge. Something's 
wrong. Something in our life. And then number four, here's what we got to do. You got to ask God for help and express gratitude to him. Ask God for help. I know it sounds very overly simplistic, but it's hard to do in the middle of the fire, in the middle of the fight, flight, or freeze anxiety symptoms we're feeling. What did Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 say again? Let's look at that. Look at this. Our response to anxiety, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be in it. Here, here we get the antidote to anxiety, prayer and gratitude. Prayer and gratitude. We practiced some of that just this morning to express our gratitude and our thanks for the goodness of God, to pray, to come to God. You know how my kids let their needs be known to me? Let me tell you how they don't let their needs be known. They don't come to me in King James Version. They don't come to me and be like, oh, thy father of plentiful bounty who always knoweth the answer and have provision for thy children. No, that's not how they, they don't come to me like that. They all come to me very differently, by the way. They all come to me, they come to me. Caleb texts, he'll like to text me his needs. Yeah, Grace will talk, she'll, she'll verbalize her needs. Abby, Abby will present her needs like a case. She's like a case attorney, man. She comes with data. She'll bring a PowerPoint presentation and be like, this is why. And, and, and to be honest, Abigail texts, calls, shouts, sings, and, and because of that, Abby gets. Just to be honest, she's the one who gets. And it doesn't matter how you cut. Look, it doesn't matter how you come. You can ask him. You can sing it, write it, sigh it, shout it. You can shout it with excitement. You can shout it with anger. God can handle it. As a loving dad, I don't care how my kids come to me. They come to me angry, frustrated. And as long as they're letting their knees be known to me, I just want my kids to come. Your father loves to hear from you. God loves to hear from you. And Paul says, nothing is going to separate me from the love of my father, nor height, nor death. If I feel like I'm on top of it or I'm getting crushed by it, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to allow anything. No demon or angel separate me from coming to the love of my father. Here's why this is so important. Prayer and gratitude is important when you're feeling anxious. Here's why the love of your father coming to him is so important. First John chapter 4 verse 18 says, there is no fear in love. It's in his presence. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. When you come to God in prayer and thanksgiving, you don't let it separate you. You don't let it keep you from God. That perfect love that your father has for you will drive out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears has not been made perfect in love. Another way to say that is the one who fears has not got in the presence of love. I got, I got to acknowledge the alarms, but then when I acknowledge them, I got to know what to do with them. I got to come to God for help and express gratitude to him. And then number five, identify the origin. Now I can identify, like, hey, where's, where's the fire? Stop getting overly fixated on the signal. And then you get anxious that you have anxiety. You ever had that? Anyone, anyone anxious about your symptoms of anxiety? And you start, why, why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? And you start having anxiety over the anxiety. Stop, stop, stop it. The, it's just a signal. It's a signal alerting you. There's nothing, that's not the problem. Stop. It's not the problem. It's alerting you to go to God, to pray, to express gratitude, to come back to a place of love, and then to identify the origin. Where, where's the fire? Where's, where's the fire in, in my life, God? What are you trying to tell me, God? Here's how King David said it in Psalm 139. Search me. That's what he said. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thought. I'm having anxiety, God, and I don't even, uh, something's off. I don't know where the fire is, God. Will you search me? Search me because I have anxious, something's off in my life. Here's what he says in verse 24. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me out. Lead me out of this place. Lead me out of the fire. Lead me into the way everlasting, God. That word offensive is a very complex word. It's, it's an okay translation of it, but it's a very complex word. Let me give you another, a few tra other translations of that word of Psalm 139, 24. Also means this in another translation. Look to see if there's any idolatrous way in me or hurtful way in me. Here's what David is praying. Search me because I got anxiety. I have anxious thoughts. I don't know where it's coming from, 
but will you see if I've erected any idols in my life, if anything is out of alignment in my life? I'm ignoring an area of my life is not surrendered to you in some way. Is there an idolatrous way? I'm, I'm actually hurting myself in some way, and I don't even know how I'm hurting myself, but I know something is off. Something's hurting. Search me. Test me. Lead me out of this because I don't even know what it is, God. Will you help me identify the origin of the fire, God? And the studies show that there are really, there's four primary reasons why you and I experience anxiety. And it's, it's so rampant right now, but really there's four primary reasons. And this is actually going to be the, the thesis of all of the series that we'll be studying. These, the primary reasons why you're anxious. I'm not going to study, I'm not going to study the anxiety with you. Like how do we defeat the anxiety and take it captive? There's room for that. Maybe we'll go there and I'll share you that. And I will, that's part of it. But maybe the anxiety isn't the problem. Maybe it's something in your ecosystem. Maybe God's actually trying to tell you there is a problem. In fact, the studies reveal that there are four reasons why you might be suffering with anxiety. Number one is you're uncertain. You are uncertain. That's what we kind of talked about today. We touched on that. I don't need certainty. I need to trust God. And if I'm going to build an anxious for nothing kind of life, then I got to embrace uncertainty. And maybe the alarm is just telling me that I'm trying to control. I'm trying to manipulate things. And things that the alarm is telling me I, I don't need certainty. It's a reminder. I don't need certainty. I need to trust God. Okay, I need to stop putting my hands to this and acting like I do have control. I, I'm uncertain. That's why some of you are anxious. You're uncertain. Number two reason is you're unsafe. You're unsafe. Your spirit knows you're not safe when you're not safe, even when you act like you are. Like your spirit knows you're unsafe financially, that you're, you're, you're not safe in your relationship. And as much as you say, oh, I can change him or I love her, your spirit knows you're unsafe. And it could be that there's not even a current threat going on, but you haven't healed from your previous wound. So you perceive unsafe environments and unsafe people preemptively because you haven't healed from your previous trauma. And so you think you're unsafe. You're, you're unsafe, and it's not really that there's an unsafe thing. You just haven't healed what was unsafe before. But you're, that's why you're anxious. You're sensing you're unsafe. Number three reason, you're unhealthy. You are unhealthy mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Your health is not sustainable. You use stimulants to wake you up and you numb yourself to bed through social media. What you put in your body matters. What you put, what you consume through your eyes, what you consume through your mouth, what you consume through your ears, it, it matters. Maybe anxiety isn't the problem. Maybe God's trying to get your attention and tell you, you need to lose 50 pounds, bro. You need to stop eating like you're a garbage truck, sister. I'm teaching hard on this, huh? I love you, but I love you. Can I just tell you I love you? Anxiety is not your problem. And I just, I just, I'm trying to help you find the origin of this thing. Because you can keep going around, going around this, going around this mountain, but maybe God's actually trying to get your attention. Maybe you're uncertain. Maybe you're unsafe. Maybe you're unhealthy. Or number four, maybe you're unoccupied you're lonely you're alone and your body knows it as much as you like to pretend that you got it under control and you don't need anybody else and you don't need to share your feelings and you don't need a group and you don't need your body knows your spirit knows you were created for a community that you were not made to keep it all in but you need other people around you you need the company and your body knows you're alone and it's sending you triggers and you keep numbing it and silencing it but you're unaccompanied and you're filled with anxiety because of it got to find the origin. We're going to study these together over the next several weeks. We're going to get to the origin of some of these things and stop silencing the alarm and changing our life. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. Then number six, number six, what we're going to do is we're going to live in freedom, not relief. Live in freedom, not relief. The goal is not relief. The goal is not comfort. The goal is not peace and quiet. The goal is freedom. That's the goal. And you have to fight for your freedom. You have to face your demons. You have to face your wounds. You have to face your anxiety. You have to face your past. You have to face your disciplines and solve for freedom. Freedom. That's the goal. Freedom. Control is not freedom. Certainty is not freedom. Freedom is the presence of God. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and then we're going to pray. Let me. Romans 12, 2 says, don't become like the people of this world. You're to be different, child of God. How you respond to the, the perplexities, the pressures, the trials, the testing. Don't become like the people of this world. Don't handle it the way they handle it. You're different, child of God. You have something greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Don't become like the people of this world. Instead, you got to change the way you think. Then you will always be able to determine what God really wants. And here's what God wants. He wants what's good for you. Pleasing and perfect, custom made for you. This is what God wants. So we need to redefine our anxiety and how we're responding to it in our life. Can I pray for you? Let me pray that over you. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.